My name is Martha Bristow, and I'm here from Summer Sessions to welcome you to tonight's presentation. Um, thank you for coming out. Isn't it funny how you don't really need an umbrella in Fairbanks until you really need an umbrella in Fairbanks? Uh, so thanks for coming out in the rain. Um, we have our, well, I can't remember what, how many we've had, but um, this is our almost next to last Discover Alaska lecture. And uh, it's been a great summer. We, I've learned a lot. And um, I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot tonight. We have with us tonight uh, Dr. Jeff Rasick, who is going to, isn't that beautiful? I was, I was just noticing how beautiful that slide is, that uh, piece of obsidian. Uh, but before I turn it over to Dr. Rasick, I have a few announcements from summer sessions. Um, and the first one is uh, tomorrow night we have uh, music in the garden, and it's the Red Hackle Pipe Band. And I've been looking to the, forward to this one all summer, so um, I'm hoping the weather clears up for the Red Hackle Pipe Band. But that'll be in the Georgeson Bot Botanical Garden at 7 o'clock. Um, if it's smoky, we'll have them in the Davis Concert Hall. I don't know about um, rain, so stay tuned. <coughs> Next Wednesday at this time, um, we'll have Debbie Miller here. Um, many of you probably know that name. She's a... Um, well-known Fair Fairbanks author, and she has written extensively about the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And the title of her talk is Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, Past, Present, Future. And so it's um, about time for another presidential campaign, so it's probably time to study up on the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, please take this opportunity to silence your cell phone. Thank you. And I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Jeff Rasick, Chief of Resources for the Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve and Gates of the Arctic National Park and Preserve. He's an archaeologist with a special interest in the archaeology of northern hunter-gatherers. Recent projects include research on obsidian sources in Alaska and their geochemical characterization, the Arctic small tradition in northern Alaska, archaeological surveys on the Alaskan Peninsula, and the origins of fluted projectile point technology in Alaska. And I had to look up obsidian. I kind of knew what it was, but I wasn't 100% sure. And it's um, glass found in lava flows. Um, and it was used in early weapons in many places on the globe, including Alaska. Dr. Basic is particularly interested in how the earliest people of the North used obsidian in their quest to make a living at the end of the last ice age. Um, he just got back into town. He's been out in the field. Um, Archaeologists don't have to spend their summers in offices, right? And um, he was on the Seward Peninsula with a youth science and, science and culture camp focusing on the history and archaeology of the Bering Straits region. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Jeff Rasick. Can you hear me okay? Thanks, Martha. Wow, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's uh, an amazing turnout. I wasn't, I wasn't sure as I was preparing if it was going to be a beautiful day that I could blame on uh, a poor turnout or terrible weather, but uh, neither one. There's a great turnout here. It's exciting to be here. Um, yeah, Martha mentioned that I was at a uh, high school science and archaeology camp last week, and I think the high school... Uh, the high school students' short attention span rubbed off on me a little bit. So I have a confession to make. I've done a little bit of a bait and switch here. This is a talk about obsidian, but I've come prepared to uh, deliver some bonus talks. I'm going to add four other talks on top of this one. So they're going to be short for mostly my own short attention span. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through some things we've learned about obsidian, and I'm going to touch on a couple of other um, stories that are just too good to pass up as an archaeologist with an audience like this. So I want to share them with you. Um, the other thing I want to do is, uh, it's on me to entertain you a little bit tonight. You could be at home doing something a lot more uh, entertaining by some people's measure uh, or spending time with your family, but you're here with me, and I want to make it a good show, but I'm going to ask you to help me a little bit and interrupt me and interact a little bit and raise your hand if you have a question or do this if I wait if I uh, wander off into the weeds or use too much jargon 
And to encourage you to do that, I brought a pile of books that I'll give out. So the first person that raises their hand and, ans and asks a question, you get a free book. It's a nice book by an archaeologist that's worked in Alaska for years. He was here at the University of Alaska Museum for a long time as the curator. And uh, Jim Dixon wrote this book. Oh, you have a question. I have a book. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'd pay the first person to do that. It works every time. Uh, yeah, you have a question too. What's that? Of uh, this book, I, I think it came out in uh, just last year in 2014. So, uh, good deep question there. I appreciate it. Uh, the books are going to go fast. I can see that's good. But I also have a sign-up list at the end. If you raise your hand and you didn't, if I ran out of books, I'll mail you one. Uh, there's also a poster, this great poster that some artists uh, I've worked with uh, created. It's up on the slide here. I got a stack of these. It's for Alaska Archaeology Month, which is every April. And the guy, the talented artist that did this, used to work for Marvel Comics. So you can cite it. We're trying to bring some action back to prehistory and bring these artifacts alive, and I think he does a good job of that. Uh, a couple other stories I'll talk about on top of obsidian are, uh, I'm going to talk about rock art. I'm going to talk about alpine ice patches that have, they're like frozen time capsules for archaeologists and caves in, in Alaska, and interesting things we've looked for and sometimes found in caves. So uh, just real quickly about me and where I come from, Martha mentioned, uh, I'm an archaeologist. Actually, I'm a middle manager now. I work for the National Park Service, and I do a lot of email and write memos. But I still get to go out in the field sometimes and do things like this in neat places. Uh, I work for Gates of the Arctic National Park and Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve. My office is just right down the hill on Geist Road. And I've worked most of my career, though, uh, north of the Arctic Circle in those Western Arctic parklands, Cape Cruisenstern, No Attack National Preserve, a little bit in Bering Land Bridge Preserve. A lot of those national parks were created because of the neat archaeology they contained. Congress set them aside to protect the archaeology and a bunch of other things there too, but um, I've got a single track mind about that stuff sometimes. So um, here, here are the national parks we have in Alaska, and every single one of them has a story about human history in an archaeological record. This is field work in, on a good day. Alaskan parks are pretty new. They're just a few decades old, and they're huge, and they're remote. They're expensive to get to, hard to work in. Uh, one message I'd like to get across to you today is how little we know about the prehistory of Alaska. There's all kinds of major discoveries yet to be made. We're still learning what's out there. They're national parks. We're charged with protecting these. Uh, these treasures, these resources. Uh, but the first step is finding out what we have. So we do a lot of this. We walk around in these gorgeous places. It's such a privilege. And we document what we found. We get our, what we find. We get our notebooks out and our cameras and we record what's out there. Uh, all the things that archaeologists collect, and we don't collect everything, but when we excavate or when we uh, decide to take a sample of something, all those things go to a museum or a repository where they're on. Uh, they're preserved for the next 500 years. They're available for other researchers to uh, do work on. They're available to students to uh, to learn about. Yeah? Is that a boomerang? Uh, no, it's not a boomerang. This is a collection of artifacts from Barrow that are at the Smithsonian. Um, I, I think the piece you're looking at, I don't know, maybe somebody else in the audience knows. It could be part of an ice scoop. Uh, just like nowadays when we're ice fishing, the little chips of ice you remove as they accumulate. It could be that. Uh, a lot of those sorts of pieces are sled parts or kayak parts. But if someone really knows the answer, they could speak up. Oh, yeah. I was wondering, um, how, do you, how do you get involved in one of these expeditions out in the Arctic? Like, how do you get Yeah, well, you can get a career in this. There's lots of volunteer. You know, you go to graduate school and you study these things and you apply for jobs and get it. That's that's a, a, a common route. Uh, but there's lots of volunteer opportunities. There's lots of field schools um, you, uh, for all ages. Um, and uh, teachers are another group of individuals that come out. Um, 
you don't have to be an archaeologist to be on an archaeological project, but you could be the uh, botanical expert, the plant expert, or the soil and sediments expert. There's almost always a multidisciplinary team, and archaeology is a very eclectic uh, field that draws on a lot of other expertise. So that's another path I, I, I could think of off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, good, good. Um, so we, we hold on to these artifacts so that 50 years down the road, we can uh, ask new questions of these artifacts, do new analyses. Uh, that's part of the obsidian story here. A lot of the work that's been done is not field work, but work in museums. Uh, another facet of my career, this is a really important thing to me, is working with the people who live in these communities and who have the strongest connection to these sites and artifacts. This is a group of Nunamute elders that went out to some archaeological sites with us a few years ago in Gates of the Arctic. They live in Anaktubik Pass. They used to live at this site when they were kids, and they hadn't been there in 60 years. But when they went back, um, all that, uh, all the things in that site came alive in front of my face. And I'll, I'll, I'll never be the same kind of archaeologist again after seeing that. This humble wash bin was the topic of intense conversation in Inupiat for an hour. When they found that wash bin, it just brought all these memories back. They knew who owned that wash bin. They knew that it had come from uh, Kaktovik on a dog pack uh, 200 miles inland, and they knew the guy's name who used that. And his, um, his preference to have a nice warm bath at the end of the day, he, and, and also feed his dogs out of this wash bin. So it was, it was just a story on top of story. And so as you see the artifacts in my slideshow here, you can think that, wow, there's probably some good stories behind that. A lot of them are lost because they're so old, but archaeologists are trying our, our best to bring some of those stories back alive. Um, archaeology is always a team effort. All the things that I'll show you today um, are things that I've uh, happened to work on, but almost always have built on the people who have come before me. So John Cook's here in the audience, and he's, he's the father of obsidian studies in Alaska. And everything that, that we've come up with about obsidian is uh, thanks to, to, to early work that John did. And uh, some of my mentors here, like Bob Gal, um, were very generous in sharing uh, the information they had accumulated in their career. So. Um, lots of people participate in these projects, students, other specialists, uh, and, and colleagues. And kids, too. They, despite the look on Brandon's face here, he really had a good time in Anaktubik <laughs> Pass on this, <laughs> on this excavation. Uh, before I launch into this show, this is the one photo I wanted to show to set the stage so that you can appreciate the... Uh, the amazing things I'm going to show after this. This is a typical site in northern Alaska. The emphasis of my talk is northern Alaska, where I know things the best and have done most of my work. Uh, these are stone flakes. They're not obsidian, but it's a glass, glassy material. It's chert. It's a sedimentary rock that occurs in lots of places in the Brooks Range. And people made their tools out of this stuff. And in the process, created a whole bunch of these shards, these fragments that are littering the ground all over northern Alaska. So. 99% of the sites we find are like this. They have just a few flakes. Uh, there's problems with these sites. We don't know how old they are. We don't really know what people were doing other than they made some stone tools here. And often, the things at these sites are a bunch of different times all mixed together. So it's very common to find a, a rifle cartridge next to a stone tool that you suspect is 3,000 years old. And you know that all the tools there could be from any time range. It's a very tricky problem. Um, and there's nothing below the surface. That's another typical thing about this shot. There, all the things from all the time people occupied this landform is right there on the surface mixed together. There is no layer cake below this uh, site to figure out the chronology of what people were doing around there. But the things I'm going to talk about the rest of uh, today are the other 1%, the kind of phenomenal things, or ways we've found to tease a better story out of those sort of commonplace uh, scatters of stone tools. 
Any questions right now before I launch into this? I'll really get into the weeds on obsidian. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is an artifact of obsidian. It's, it's volcanic glass. It occurs in a bunch of different places in Alaska. Alaska has a lot of volcanic activity, and it's a hot spot on the planet uh, for the occurrence of volcanic glass. And people have been using it for almost 14,000 years, or probably more than 14,000 years, for the tips of weapons. In, in a pre-metal time, this was the source of all your cutting tools and tools used to pierce, uh, scrape, or cut. So this was an important material. And obsidian, I, I showed you an example of chert earlier. Obsidian is the very glassiest and finest of all these rocks that you can shape this way. Uh, archaeologists love obsidian because through chemical tests, we can, we can examine the chemical composition of this piece of obsidian from an archaeological site. And with great confidence, we can match it to the geological source from where it came. So we know where on the planet this artifact originated in the geological outcrop, in, in the stream gravel somewhere in the mountains or in a, an actual outcrop of rock. Um, and this one came from 175 miles away from where it was found in an archaeological site. That's a really neat piece of information because if you add a bunch of those pieces together, you can start to stitch together how people are circulating around the landscape, uh, who they have trade interactions with, uh, uh, how they're interacting with neighboring cultural groups, things like that. So uh, some flesh to add to the skeleton of these lithic shatters. Yeah. You can. Um, I don't know about quickly or reliably, but there are ways you can measure the age of an obsidian artifact through a weathering rind, the thickness of a weathering rind. Uh, it's tricky business, though, because it depends on the specific environment that artifact's been in for 5,000 or 10,000 years. That environment varies over time, and there's a whole bunch of assumptions built into how you calculate the age. So they can be off by a lot. Um, it, can, it can be handy, though, in some cases to tell you the relative age. You know which artifacts are older than others, even if you can't say it's 5,200 years old. So still, radiocarbon dating is by far our preference for dating these things. You can't directly date rocks with radiocarbon dating, but that obsidian hydration method is one way to get a rough age uh, of an obsidian artifact. That's a great question. Um, my, my search or my involvement with this research started with this artifact or one very similar to it that came from Yukon Charlie Rivers Preserve over on the uh, abutting the Yukon border on the upper Yukon River. We had this analyzed at a lab and, they, and we wanted to know where it came from and I had a naive assumption that um, that was an answer that was easy to come by and they came back with an answer of unknown. Oh, we don't know where this came from. So we started to investigate this. And uh, it led to us uh, obtaining a machine, an x-ray fluorescence analyzer, that um, it, it's literally a ray gun. It's a gun-shaped thing. It has a handle and a trigger, and it shoots x-rays. And we shoot it into artifacts. And in, in 300 seconds, we have a, a measurement of all the trace elements in, uh, in that piece of uh, obsidian. And we... The combination of elements is specific to a source, so we have assembled this graph. It's the only graph I'll show tonight. And um, you can see there is, um, let's see if I can point to one. Uh, Botsatana down here in the lower left, that red one, that's the major source of obsidian in Alaska. And you can see it has a cluster. These are all the artifacts we had analyzed at the time that had that combination of zirconium and strontium. Here's a source up in the Aleutian Islands called Akma, or down in the Aleutian Islands. This is one called Wiki Peak over in Wrangell St. Elias National Park near the Yukon border. So each obsidian uh, source has this unique fingerprint. Uh, I, I should say, too, this XRF technology is, has been an amazing boon to this kind of research because it's fast and, and it's non destructive. It doesn't take any kind of uh, cutting of the tool. It doesn't destroy the tool. It doesn't turn it into a radioactive piece of waste like some other uh, techniques. Uh, 
It's also portable. That's a really important thing. We can take this ray gun, and if we can get it through uh, TSA security to the <laughs> museum somewhere, we can travel to the museum. That's a, that's a huge uh, deal to museums who are very careful about mailing their artifacts off or sharing them with other people. So we can travel there, open the drawers, zap all the artifacts they have at the Smithsonian or the University of Pennsylvania Museum uh, or wherever around the world. Artifact collections from the last are scattered all over the world. And we've traveled to a lot of those places to analyze them. Yeah, you had a question. Two questions. So each mark represents a future city and town or the uh, each X or each triangle on this graph is one analysis we've done. And, and the vast majority of these are artifacts. Some of them are sources of, or, or pieces of obsidian that we've gotten from the source. So that's how we know that the, the Botsitana dots from artifacts are the same as, are from that source, because the source and the artifact X's or triangles line up on this graph. And there's lots of little exceptions. Uh, there's still uh, dozens of unknowns. And you get odd things if there's a glob of uh, cortex or some other uh, material mixed in the obsidian. But the vast majority of cases, it's a really uh, simple matter of matching a couple of these key elements. We measure nine elements, so this is a simplified graph here. Uh, in almost all cases, all seven or nine of those elements are are in a very narrow range and match up very well between the source and the artifact. Does that answer your question? Okay. You. you had another one too. Did you write down the book? Yeah. Only one book though. <laughs> <laughs> or a poster, there's posters there too. You had a question? Yeah. Jack? Um, <laughs> what are the X's and triangles? They represent an artifact that we analyze. So each dot on this graph is an artifact that we analyze. By now, we ha I think we have, uh, there's more than 10,000, maybe 10,500, and then I just heard from you, you've analyzed another, another 700, so it's well over uh, 11,000 now, and uh, there's, you know, there's a couple other, I'd say, satellite groups that are working on batches of this stuff, and periodically we put it all together to make sense of those uh, unknowns and check the patterns again, so over 11,000, that's, that's a big deal. A lot of academ academic journal articles that are published on this kind of problem, they may have analyzed 70 artifacts. This is a massive data set. What, what type of unknowns that make the most sense that they end up having to keep in track Yeah, so, yeah, good question. So your question was, uh, did that initial mystery microblade uh, ever get a match? Does it, or where does it show up on this graph? And it didn't show up on this graph. Uh, you can put it on the graph, but it doesn't match any of these groups still. You know, that, that was an artifact we measured when the database probably had three or 4,000 items in it. Now we have 11,000. I periodically go back and check those unknowns. That one's still an unknown. Exactly. It's a totally unique item. Uh, that's another thing we do. We not only match to the known sources, we try to match a new analysis to any other analysis. So for many of the sources, or for many of our analyses, um, here's just a shot. I'll, I'll get to it. There's a good slide showing that uh, next. But here's a shot of the museum end of it. This is in Magadan, uh, Russia. We went there. Uh, a couple of us a few months ago, just last winter, and um, analyzed obsidian in the Russian Far East, looking for examples of Alaskan obsidian on the other side of the Bering Strait. Um, so here's a, here's a couple of numbers to look at. There's 84 geochemical groups. A group is a unique chemical signature. You can see only four to 43 of those are known geological sources. That means uh, 41 only match other artifacts. Those are all unknowns in a way. We know it's a group. We're very convinced that that represents a source, but we haven't found the source on the ground. Yeah? Can you match more than just Siberian International? Yeah, um, we've only gone as far as Kamchatka, Chukotka, 
and a little bit west of Tutoka. In, in, it, we've confined it to the Russian Far East. We haven't routinely looked at Japan as a source of obsidian, but that's dimly on our radar. And they have their sources pretty well characterized. Um, and to the, uh, to the east, we take on Northwest Territories, Yukon, and Northern British Columbia. And that's gradually crept out, but we're, we're trying not to do the whole world yet. <laughs> There's still plenty to figure out in Alaska. But this does, we are aware that there could be very, very long distance transport from some places that um, wouldn't show up in our, our universe here. Um, but th those usually stand out. Any other questions? Which is my favorite museum? Oh, well, that that trip to Magadan was amazing. That that's the uh, the central repository in Magadan for the Russian Far East. It has collections from Kamchatka and all over Tukotka. And uh, you saw it. It was like redigging the site. You're you're literally excavating in their repository. This is a little different than it looks across the parking lot in our museum. Uh, it's just wooden tray after wooden tray and. Usually you want the one on the bottom of the stack, so you have to remove the top nine. And this was in the sub-basement of an old Soviet-era cast concrete building. We literally crawled through a trap door to get down there every morning. We'd spend 14 hours down there with our headlamps on. And it's only a half-height ceiling, so you're hunched over and constantly hitting your head on these beams. So it was a, it was a real adventure there. Uh, and crazy things too, you go down an aisle and there's a tray of human skulls and another tray of beads from a Neolithic uh, crypt and just all kinds of treasures there. It wasn't just the obsidian and it, and it gave me an incredible glimpse of what um, in Alaska we're always thinking things here originated a little bit earlier in the Russian Far East and here was a chance to see all those similarities firsthand and they're they're pretty astounding, these similarities, but the differences are even more astounding. So I, I could do a whole nother talk on that. Good question. Um, part of the search was tracking down these unknowns. When we have a source group, we suspect it's a, it's a hypothetical source, but we haven't found it on the ground. We start doing this. We start following in the footsteps of prehistoric prospectors and geologists. They found these sources. Uh, one incredible fact that emerges from this research is that in every region that has obsidian in Alaska, all the sources, nearly all the sources are used as soon as people are present in the archaeological record. As soon as people settle the region of Alaska, they're immediately using all the obsidian sources. So it tells me they were ace prospectors. They were great geologists that found all the important raw materials really fast. Obsidian is used for very few things today. Um, craft activities, there's a whole community out there of people that recreate these old technologies and they make uh, arrowheads for bolo ties and belt buckles. And you can find some at Sportsman's Warehouse if you, if you look in their knife case. Um, they often cheat a little bit and uh, use modern grinding tools and so forth to shape their tools. One other use though, I don't know if this is still happening, but in recent years, uh, an outfit made a go of creating surgical scalpels out of obsidian. It's a sharper edge than a modern steel scalpel. So the scars, the cuts, the, the cuts heal very well and there's little scarring. And there was a, a niche market that maybe never got off the ground of surgical tools made of obsidian, especially for heart surgery. So that, that's really the only uses I, I know of obsidian Do they still do that? Not that I know of. I haven't seen anything about that. And uh, it, I, think, I suspect it went away 15 years ago. Um, this is kind of a fun thing to do is walk these streams and find obsidian. And it's a kind of a simple... Uh, principle behind it. You, at every fork, you see which stream has little pieces of obsidian. And if it has them, you follow that fork. And if it doesn't, you rule it out. And you work up. And in this case, this is the source of Wikipedia obsidian, right? In this, 
and there was a pocket here. And we did that in every stream in this area around the Wiki Peak source. I know John had worked there earlier, but um, we, we had some nice helicopter support to do a real thorough, methodical job of all the, uh, of all the streams emanating from where this geological deposit was known. So we really pinpointed all the places this obsidian was coming from. One of the questions we had in mind was, uh, is it just one uniform fingerprint in this source area? Or is there a range of variation in the chemistry that may, might make it look like two or more fingerprints? That wasn't the case here at Wiki Peak, but at other obsidian sources, we have found that to be true where there's two or more fingerprints. So then we add that to our list for comparison and we know where it comes from on the landscape. And, and this is what it looks like when you map the data out from one source. There's usually a dense cluster near the source and it thins out away. But you can see in this map that there's some flyers, there's some outliers, and those are always really interesting. So here's a piece of Wiki Peak Obsidian from near the Canadian border that shows up out here in Dutch Harbor. And this is an absolute rock solid case. This artifact is, the, the location in the site is known within a centimeter and it has a catalog number on it. It's not a case where this artifact fell from another drawer in the museum, that happens once in a while. Uh, but this is a, a good case, it's about 3,000 years old and there's a story here, I don't know exactly what it is. There was a lot of um, down the line handoffs to get this a thousand miles away or a couple of really adventurous traders were venturing far from home. That crosses different language barriers and, and some tough terrain. They were traveling on foot and by, by boat, so uh, neat stuff. We've also learned something about international contacts. I mentioned this a little bit with that Magadan research. Uh, one of the points of going to Magadan was to pinpoint all, uh, to pin down all the uh, sources in the Russian Far East. We knew of this one called Krasnoya Lake, Red Lake. It's the major source over in uh, Chukotka. And it shows up, these blue dots here are cases of uh, Russian obsidian in Alaska. Generally on the coast, a few specimens from St. Lawrence Island. Uh, yeah, we can call that Alaska. Uh, some on the mainland, there's this one here up on the Kobuk River, you can see that, that example inland there. That's a 4,000 year old layer at a nicely stratified site called Onion Portage. We know exactly how old that piece is. It's 4,000 years old, pretty old, and it's pretty far inland, so um, that's a neat example. Uh, part of this story here too is that, uh, well, we kind of ruled out island hopping through the Aleutians for any significant contact uh, from Kamchatka. We, we haven't found any Kamchatka obsidian in the Aleutian Islands, which was a reasonable expectation. We did find one piece from Kamchatka on St. Lawrence Island though. And um, the other thing, the other fact to, to see from this map and graph is that it's relatively <coughs> late. This is where the Bering Land Bridge existed and this is where people were coming and going 14,000 years or more uh, ago. The first archeological evidence we have of this interaction is only 4,000 years old. For, for 10,000 years, uh, obsidian was available. People on both sides were using it, but we don't see any crossing the land bridge or the Bering Strait until 4,000 years ago. And, and even at 4,000 years ago, it's pretty sporadic. It really picks up after 1,000 years ago. So the what, the way I sort of uh, phrase this is that the, the land bridge was more of a turnstile than this busy crossroads. It, it, was, a, it was a bit of a gate at times. Okay, I'll go on to a couple other stories just quickly here. Um, there's a, several cases, a few dozen in Alaska where people lost their whole toolkit. So imagine your big craftsman tool chest in your garage and losing that all together all at once. This happened periodically in prehistory and it's a little bit of a puzzle. We think people invested in these, uh, these tools some time. Some, uh, often the materials come from far away so they invested time transporting them, gathering them, trading for them. But every so often a whole batch of tools like these arrowheads and uh, probably knives 
uh, or spearheads from Cape Cruisenstern over in northwestern Alaska are found all together. This case here, there were about 80 tools, and they came from an area this big, uh, near the beach at Cape Cruisenstern. Um, and there's lots of examples like this. Here's a big biface. It's the size of a pie plate. It's made of obsidian. Six of these were found all together um, eroding from a creek edge in the Yukon Territory. And this obsidian, we know, I analyzed it, and it comes from northern British Columbia, a couple hundred miles away. So people carried all these dinner plates and then never ate off of them. And they're found years later by archaeologists. Um, this is one more example from the Nogahabara sand dunes, not too far from Galena in the Klekatuk River drainage. These are all obsidian too, and they're all from Botsitana, that, that major source. But look here, there are all these things that they're not worn out, they're not broken, they're not those broken chips and shards that I showed you in that first slide. These are all useful tools that people bothered to carry far away from the source, uh, but then never used. The typical explanation is that they're cached. They're situated there for later use. Uh, people didn't want to carry all these heavy things around, so they stationed them at different places on the landscape. Uh, but for whatever reason, they didn't make it back to collect them. Um, you know, another possibility is that these are burial offerings. There are a few cases of uh, batches of stone tools that are in burial context, but we don't have any of those examples in Alaska. There are neat things you can learn from these batches of tools. They often, almost always, all go together. They're all from the same time period. And in this case here from Noga Habara, you can see how these tools uh, represent different stages of shaping. The, the roughest one at the left, and then a more refined tool on the right. These are tools that you would whittle away and shape into a more refined form. And all the different stages are represented here in one batch. So an, another explanation, though, that I, I've thought of, and I, I don't have the answer here, but I'm throwing out some ideas to think about, is maybe these things weren't all that valuable after all. If you lived in an area with uh, stone raw materials that were abundant, you could get this stuff anytime you're out sheep hunting or caribou hunting. And we think these are masterful creations of masterful craftsmen that made these. But if you grew up doing this stuff from age five or six, you could probably make these tools pretty effortlessly and they would look pretty great. So uh, who knows, maybe somebody here in the audience has the explanation for that. Rock art is a pretty rare thing in Alaska, but there's some really interesting examples. Uh, when you think of places like the American Southwest, you can imagine these neat images of rock art. Uh, we don't really have that in Alaska. You can see here on this map, these are all the known rock art sites. There's a whole bunch in southeast Alaska, but uh, I'm going to put that aside for now. I'm, I'm talking about the mainland and how uh, rare it is across this huge expanse of Alaska. And we know of a lot of archaeological sites. This is not stuff we routinely miss. Uh, what I really want to focus on is this little isolated cluster in northern Alaska. These are sites that occur primarily in Noatak National Preserve in the western Brooks Range. They're in the mountains. And there's a few cases up in the northern foothills. They're almost, every example, there's about five of them, follows a very strong pattern. They're found at village sites. Here on this map, you can see the red outlines. These are prehistoric houses that were excavated into the ground. They're a few hundred years old. And this is a pretty substantial settlement. This probably had, we don't know exactly how many of these houses were occupied all at the same time, but it might have had a few dozen people. Uh, maybe 50 people lived here. All these black circles are cash pits. These people were harvesting and storing a whole bunch of food here, primarily caribou, but probably some fish as well. And in these sites, each one has a big structure. Here you can see these giant boulders. They weigh a few hundred pounds apiece. People move those, and they don't occur very close to these sites, so they were moving them a half mile, a mile, something on that scale. Um, took a fair amount of labor. This, this was the foundation of a big, what we think was a communal house. So this had a wooden superstructure, maybe covered with skins. Uh, it's bigger than any other structure at the, at the settlement. It's much bigger than the houses. And in historic times, the Nupiak people would have a 
a, a, a structure like this in each settlement called a kargi or a kajgi. It was the communal house. It was the bingo hall. It was the place where people uh, sang and danced and told stories and did crafts and passed winter uh, time uh, all together. And here's some a little bit earlier examples from a few hundred years before that. Um, on a lot of the rocks in these kargis and these communal houses, we have rock art. So there are these designs and patterns that have been either sawn and grooved into the rock or pecked into the rock. There's two basic styles of creating these designs. Here's a good example of the pecking. This is a rock that's not in the kargi but isolated um, away from it, still within the settlement. It has 300 some of these little dimples pecked into it. It looks like a giant golf ball. But we know because we've looked at all the other rocks around here that this isn't natural and if you look at it closely you can see the peck marks. They're very uniform in spacing and size and depth. Uh, somebody spent lots and lots of time, this is really hard rock, pecking and pecking to create these uh, little divots and we have no idea why or what it means. Yeah. Yeah, we um, have found bits of charcoal in those kargis. Um, most of them have a stone floor, a pavement, and where we found the charcoal is in cracks between the pavement. And we presume it's associated with the, that structure and the use of that structure. We're not seeing an actual hearth or a fireplace, but we're sort of piecing together that one was probably there. They, they needed some sort of light in there for one. Uh, lamps, seal oil lamps would be a possibility. Uh, and food preparation, yeah. We haven't found food remains or bone in there, but it's easy to imagine cleaning up a place like that. Too. Yeah? What about oil lamps? Found any uh, fragments of those? Oil lamps, that's a good question. Um, we didn't find any at these sites. We've only done a very small amount of testing. We're trying to be very judicious and careful with excavating these sites because. Uh, you use a site up as you excavate it, and we wanted to have very specific questions in mind before we did much of that. So right now we've just done a tiny amount of testing, and so far we haven't found lamps. But it's a very reasonable thing to expect. Uh, it doesn't surprise me also because lamps are a thing that people would have carried with them when they left the settlement. They're not typically things broken and left there unless people plan to return. So you're asking about erosion and whether these apparent designs could be natural or if the designs are obscured because they've been eroded. Quite. Yeah, we you know we we spent a lot of time looking at these and trying to distinguish the characteristics that we think indicate that they were made by people. And we think it's a very clear example here. When you look closely, like I said, there, there you can see the little peck, individual peck marks where a rock hit. We've done some experiments to try to replicate that, and, and that matches what we're seeing on these archaeological examples. This sort of, uh, these little cups or cupules are also a design that's seen in rock art in different places in the world. So we think that all aligns to say that these are indeed made by people. When we hike away from uh, the village site, we can find big rocks that are made of the same material and have been exposed to all the same geological processes. And when you're away from the village, you never find rock art or any of these dimples. So uh, we, we think it's a pretty good case. Sometimes the dimples are linked together to form long grooves, as you can see here on the right. And those are just different uh, views of one of the rocks. Almost all those rocks with rock art are part of the kargi. So I, special things were happening there in the dim lamp light and with the drums playing and uh, everybody kind of crowded together in a, probably a, a humid and uh, smoky place. It's kind of fun to picture that. <coughs> and, and Is that up on the Noatak River? That dip of rock there? Yeah, it's off the Noatak. It's in one of the tributaries there. 
Uh, okay, here's another uh, story, quick one. Um, in the Yukon Territory, a little over 10 years ago, they discovered um, caribou dung in places that caribou don't frequent anymore. And it was a real puzzle to biologists. And uh, in, in some of these places, they started to find artifacts. So what you're seeing here in this picture is a big patch of ice. It's not glacial ice. It just sits there. It's not moving like a glacier does. Uh, some people call these snow patches. There's sort of a gray area between snow, patch and snow and ice. But that big black shadow you see at the foot of that snow, that's all caribou dung. Those are all caribou pelts. Thousands, millions of them probably, in a place that doesn't have caribou anymore. So this was something that needed explaining. What goes on is that uh, caribou, and this happens all over the north where caribou live, uh, they like to congregate on these snow and ice patches in the summer when it's hot. They can cool off, they can escape insects, and hunters in the past knew this. They knew you could go to the snow patch, they knew where all the snow patches were, they knew where all the obsidian was, they knew where everything was, and they targeted these animals. It was a good place to hunt, and once in a while, they lost their arrow or spear or dart in the snow. That's good for archaeologists because they've been in the freezer for a thousand years or for up to eight thousand years. And the wood's preserved, the sinew that's tied the stone tip to the shaft is preserved, the feathers are even preserved sometimes. So I brought an example here. This is a reconstruction of one of the Yukon ice patch darts. And so these are all very precise measurements. The, the profile of this shaft, the wood it's made from, it's birch, all the details we could uh, think about we, we replicated in this piece. It's a duck feather. This is a piece of wiki peak obsidian here on the tip. And you should come and look at this at the end. They have clever designs with a detachable fore shaft. If you broke the tip, you could rearm this piece that, that had a lot more labor go into it with um, another sharp point. But once in a while, people lost these in the snow patches. And now, because of global warming, they're thawing out. They're emerging from these ice patches. And archaeologists have been visiting them to collect uh, very rare remains. It's, it's so rare to find this kind of preservation in something so old. And yeah, go ahead. Yeah, great question. That's one of the huge values of this stuff is that you can radiocarbon date these things directly. So I mentioned earlier how you can't radiocarbon date the stone tip, but if it's attached to a feather and a wood and sinew, you can date all those things. And they've done that in the Yukon quite a bit and a little bit in Alaska. And so we know how exactly how old that stone tip is because we have been able to date the wood. And they've done this in, in dozens and dozens of examples. And they have a really nice chronology built now and when and how how long dart technology this is a dart not an arrow so this would have been thrown with a, if you have a dog and you throw uh, tennis balls with one of those chuckers that's the principle behind this this is making my arm a longer lever and people are really good at throwing these uh, far and uh, with a lot of accuracy so this is a dart and this is a dart thrower uh, about 1,000 years ago it's like night and day. Darts are used for about 7,000 years in these ice patches. They show up. Um, and then around 1,000 years ago, no more darts, all arrows. So there was this rapid transition to a new technology in the Yukon. We're not sure if the same pattern held forth in Alaska because we haven't found as much of, of this phenomenon in Alaska. But we're looking. Right now, there's a crew out in Gates of the Arctic uh, flying around to ice patches in, uh, in the Brooks Range, uh, looking at places for this phenomenon. And the giveaway is the caribou dung in almost every case. If you find a snow patch or an ice patch with caribou dung, it has great prospects for finding artifacts. So as you're out there on your sheep hunt or flying uh, around in Alaska, keep an eye out for this stuff. It's it's still a frontier. It's, it's still unexplored terrain as far as uh, what, what we've learned in Alaska. It, this is an example of the great preservation. You can see that braided sinew there. This is a, an arrow shaft from the Yukon. The wood is willow. 
it, it's another good example of where this multidisciplinary team bears down on this, and the, the ornithologist identifies the feather fragments, and plant experts are looking at the, uh, the wood, and uh, people are identifying the sinew and the pigments and everything else. So I think the oldest artifact from the Yukon, again, I keep using that as the example because it's the best, it's the hot spot, it's the best example of this phenomena in the north. And the oldest artifacts they have are, uh, I think, just over 8,000 years old. So uh, one thing that means is that these ice patches that have persisted for 8,000 years, either growing or not shrinking much in a given year, uh, are now shrinking rapidly and going away. The prediction is in the next 10 or 15 years, a lot of these snow patches are going to disappear for the last time. They've been preserved for 8,000 years in some cases, and they're disappearing now for the last time. So there's a little bit of a race to inventory this stuff and collect these highly perishable things before they thaw out and perish. Yeah? Um, yeah, um, I don't know off the top of my head what the sinew is made of. Probably caribou. I think that's a good guess. Um, the splice. What? You, I'm not sure what you're asking about with the splice. Oh, you know, I think the what you're seeing there, the shiny uh, brownish material, is part of the fletching. It's part of the feather fletching. It's it's this part here. What I get. Uh, there's red ochre designs on some of these. You can see the knock end. This is an arrow because it has, you can see it has the knock, the groove to hold the, the bowstring. The darts all have a little dimple in the end here to hold that hook. So even when you have a fragment of one of these, if it's this end fragment, you know what uh, weapon system was involved. This gives you a, a sense of scale. Those are people there on the slope of the ice patch. Um, one thing I'm really uh, excited about in the Brooks Range, we have two things they don't have in the Yukon Territory. We have some ethnographic accounts of people using this strategy, targeting animals and snow patches, so we know it was happening there. Um, it had been a lost tradition. There's a break in this activity in the Yukon, so there's no direct oral history about this. We have that in a few cases in the Brooks Range. The other thing we have is we've done some, um, we've done a lot of research on caribou movement. Uh, the Western Arctic caribou herd and the Peshikpuk herd and the Central Alaska herd all frequent gates of the Arctic, and a lot of those animals have GPS radio collars, so we know where they spend time in the winter are in the summer, in the late summer, when uh, caribou are trying to cool off and escape bugs. We know where they're at. So we're targeting those places where the GPS signals show up near what we know are snow patches. And we think those have a high probability to have uh, these artifacts. At least it, it, it ups the odds slightly in this big uh, needle in the haystack effort. You have to, you have to visit dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of these snow patches to find uh, a, a few artifacts. So it's a high investment, but a pretty neat return when you get lucky and find something. Here's a volunteer activity for someone. You can collect caribou dung at one of these snow patches if you get on one of these projects. Here's some lucky kid, First Nations kids from the southern Yukon who participated in some of that. Uh, I kid, but it's a uh, it's a really rich source of ecological data from, again, an 8,000-year span. You can study uh, the nuances of caribou diet and uh, all kinds of other uh, ecological treasures are preserved in these ice patches, even when there aren't artifacts. Yeah? How thick is that layer? Uh, it's less a layer of caribou. This is on that melting edge, and this is just kind of all the stuff that's melted out and oozed down. Uh, they have spent time coring these and uh, cutting with chainsaws to get good, clean profiles of these ice patches. And the layers are all pretty thin. There's just a lot of them in some of the snow patches, and when they melt and compress, it looks like this giant mass. 
And here's a shot from Gates of the Arctic. This is one of the better uh, ice patches that we've found. There's some animal remains around there. We haven't found artifacts yet, but this is one we revisit whenever we're in the area, and I think in any given year we might get lucky and find a, an arrow shaft here. Uh, real quickly, there's a couple more minutes here. I'll squeeze one more story in. Caves are a really neat thing to archaeologists because unlike that first slide I showed where everything's compressed on the surface, caves sometimes have deep stratified deposits. By stratified, I mean there's a layer cake, and the top layer is younger than the bottom layer. And you can, it's like having a, a book that's, the, the, the numbered pages are in order instead of torn out and scattered around on the tundra. So to get a sense of scale here, that, that's a stratigraphic profile. You're looking at a cross section of where archaeologists dug in Mummy Cave. I think that's in Utah, somewhere in the southwest. It's almost 30 feet deep. And those little basin-shaped features there, oh, are uh, these sort of things here are fire hard. So those are probably this thick. That gives you a sense of scale here. So all these nice layers, and when you find an artifact in a particular layer, you can figure out how old it is. Caves also have excellent preservation. So here's uh, a duck decoy from one of these caves in the American Southwest. It's made of grass and reeds and feathers, and, you, and it's a few thousand years old. You can see how uh, wonderfully preserved it is. Uh, that's one of the treasure troves to be found in caves. So archaeologists are really keen to find caves and explore them for archaeological materials. We've kind of struck out on that count in Alaska. There's a lot of caves that have been examined by archaeologists, and they generally don't have much in them, or if they do, it isn't in that nice, neat layer cake. It's jumbled up. Uh, a lot of things root around in caves and, and can disturb that nice, neat stratigraphy. So uh, caves have often been kind of a tease. They, they sometimes seem to have very ancient evidence of human activity. This is bluefish caves. This is a replica of bluefish caves. That's a famous archaeological and paleontological site in the northern Yukon. If, if you're from Canada, you think this is the oldest site in North America, and there are, is evidence for people 25,000 years ago. If you're Dale Guthrie or somebody that works in Alaska, you think, ah, maybe not. Maybe those bones broke naturally from a variety of causes, and some of them we don't understand very completely. There's a few stone tools. Those are good evidence of human presence at this site, but we don't know exactly how old they are. They might just be 10,000 years old, which isn't anything remarkable. So these, again, these, these cave sites can be a bit of a tease. This is, uh, some, these are artifacts from a cave on the Seward Peninsula in western Alaska called Trail Creek Caves. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of the caves in the north, here in Alaska and the Yukon, don't have very much evidence of human activity at all. They have very few artifacts. Trail Creek Caves is an exception to that. There are a lot of artifacts in that cave. Um, there is some good organic preservation. The examples on the left are bone and antler um, spear and arrow tips. Uh, the ones on the right, obviously, are stone. One of the patterns you can see here is that they're all weapons. They're all things that I think uh, a lot of these are, are lost and accumulate in caves because they hit an, a wounded animal and the animal's been dragged in there by a scavenger or has gone, has gone in there to die. We don't see a lot of evidence in Alaskan caves that people were living in them. They maybe ducked out of the rain and had tea in there, but they're not living in there. They're not raising families. They're not cooking food. They're not doing all those activities that generate a whole bunch of archaeological uh, detritus, uh, which is common in the American Southwest and in Africa and through Asia and lots of places on the planet. It's, it just doesn't seem to be the case here in Alaska. And I don't know why. I don't know why that is, but it's, it's a bit of a puzzle. We keep looking at caves, though, and there's some in Yukon Charlie, one of the parks I work in. Uh, a lot of limestone geology there. It's not too far from Bluefish Caves. And uh, we find great things like this. Here's a sheep bone, a doll sheep. It's 17,000 years old. We had a radiocarbon date run from this. And you can see what great preservation that is. This is something you could find walking around in the tundra, and you'd guess it's 
five years old or 20 years old. This one's 17,000. So we know there's old things in these caves, and we know there's good organic preservation, uh, even of very fine, delicate bones. You can see all these rodent bones. In this cave in Yukon Charlie, we found hare and raven, a variety of birds, sheep, bears, fox. Uh, it's a really nice set of uh, animal remains to say something about animals that lived there in the past, but we haven't found any artifacts yet. So it's kind of, it's another needle in the haystack adventure, and we keep chipping away at this one, hoping to find something. It would be really important because this site does have a nice, neat layer cake, and the layer cake dates from 12,000 to 22,000 years old. So it's an interesting time at the end of the Ice Age uh, to find uh, evidence of humans and to learn about how they were living during that time in Alaska. Yeah. So um, on that other picture, the bone, um, was, was the marrow taken out? This bone was cracked, and, and by all indications, it was something a scavenger did, uh, another animal did. Uh, we, we examined these pretty closely for cut marks and other evidence for humans being involved. Uh, that can be tricky evidence to discern, but we haven't seen any even intriguing leads in that regard. Uh, and then the real hard work happens back in the lab uh, where you have to clean up all these bones and sort them out and uh, identify all those little fragments. So we've had some good help doing that. Um, you know, I'm going to just wrap it up there. We've gone an hour, and I, it would be nice to leave a little time for uh, other questions if people have them. This stuff will have to wait for the next talk. That's a horse bone, though, which we found in an archaeological site in northern Alaska. Can you hear this? One, it's a horse bone. And uh, this got us real excited for a while because there isn't any good, clear evidence of human hunting of horses in Alaska. We found this in a site at the very bottom, in fact, below all the archaeology. And uh, the archaeology is dated to about 11,000 years old. This horse, or this horse bone dated to... 17,000 years old. So it just happened to be a bone that washed down a gravel bar and an archaeological site developed it over it later on. Um, if anything I've said to you tonight is interesting, here's things you can do after you leave this room. This is the one book I recommend to anybody if you're curious about Alaskan archaeology. Um, it was written in 1964, but it holds up really well. It's like a detective novel. It's an adventure story about how this archaeologist, Louis Giddings, um, sorted out the chronology of northwestern Alaska and the Bering Strait. And uh, it's very readable, and there's lots of copies of it available on Amazon used. Uh, visit a museum. We have the best museum in Alaska is right here across the parking lot here in Fairbanks, but there's lots of other good ones. And uh, a lot of them have archaeological materials. A lot of the material, most of the material, 99% of the archaeological material is in the basement. But I encourage people to ask about that. And most curators, I think, if they're worth anything, will um, find a way to let you see that stuff. You don't have to be a scholar with a PhD to get access to that 99% of the stuff. Uh, school groups see it and other people uh, craftsmen are often uh, asking about old ivory carvings so that they can uh, get inspired about new ones and things like that. So there's lots of reasons to use it. Use the collections. That's what they're there for. And, um, and then finally, if you find an archaeological site as you're walking around places in Alaska, don't assume that anybody's recorded it before or that scientists know about it. Odds are that we don't. And it's a big help to us if, number one, you leave the stuff there, and number two, take a photograph, and if you can, a GPS coordinate, and report it to someone. It's easy to Google an archaeologist in Alaska and let them know about something you found. Um, what I always do if someone does that to me is I let them name the site. There's a site registry that the state of Alaska maintains of all the archaeological sites that have ever been reported, and there's a slot for naming the site. You could name the site any. Uh, you can name the site some crazy thing, or after your favorite kid or pet or whatever you want. And know it's there in this registry uh, on record. And it's a, a piece of the puzzle that we can stitch together and 
how some of these stories tell. Thanks. Thanks for uh, listening and thanks for your attention. <laughs>
yeah, it's a great question. Was obsidian a highly preferred material? That if, if given the option, you would always use obsidian over some one of these other rocks? I don't think so. Uh, and here's the reason. Obsidian is exceptionally sharp, and it's very easy to shape, but it's very brittle. So it's not, there's a lot of purposes that the obsidian is not very good at. If you want an adze or an axe for some heavy-duty woodworking or chopping bone, you don't want obsidian. So th there's some functional aspects there. You're exactly right, though, that another value of obsidian, we know is highly valued for lots of things, but one of the values was, it, I think, its aesthetic uh, uh, appeal, and, and it's exotic. It often comes from far away, so it had some bling value. You know, it, it was a thing that you could show off and, like you said, uh, demonstrate your status. It showed your connections and your worldliness if you had some exotic obsidian. I think that's definitely part of it. Hi. Um, so I know um, this is probably a dark there, but there was a lot of um, struggle in that period. Do you recall the obsidian from the thing that the Norse did like to have? And would you agree with Kismet um, obsidian that it was migrated farther north to southeast Alaska? Because I'm from Alaska, but uh -huh. Yeah, Sumez Island, you mentioned that's a big source of obsidian in southeast Alaska. Um, I was trying to think how far north that ever occurs. It's almost entirely confined to the panhandle. Uh, we've looked real carefully in the southern Yukon, and I can't think of any examples where that gets very far inland, maybe past um, you know, the Chilkoot Pass in that area. There's a little bit of obsidian in there. Um, we've also looked real hard for those southern Yukon sources and inland Yukon making it down into southeast Alaska. We know those were trade routes. We know certain things were flowing up and down from the coast to inland. Doesn't look like obsidian was a big part of it. We don't see a lot uh, crossing that divide. And then as far as the microblades, um, yeah, that's a, a common kind of tool. Microblades are little razor blades like slivers of obsidian. It's sort of the original uh, safety or, you know, razor blade. And, uh, and uh, it, yeah, obsidian is a great material for making that kind of fine tool. It's very easy to flake. You see a lot of microblades made out of it. Um, but we, we see other materials that are used for microblades, too. Yeah. Yeah. So is, is Sumez obsidian found? Is that southeast? Okay. Uh, I know that that Mount of Ziza source, that's in the northern uh, part of British Columbia inland, it's found way up into Alaska. It's coming down the Yukon. So we see it in Eagle. We see it in the White Mountains a little bit even. Um, I don't know about the Sumez Island obsidian in the interior. There's... You know, I, I, I painted you the simple picture about how these fingerprints are so distinct, but John's brought up a good example. That, that source in British Columbia is highly variable. It's not like Wiki Peak where that fingerprint is small and tight. There's a lot of different flows in, in northern British Columbia at this one thing we call the source. And there's a lot of chemical variation there. And some of it overlaps with that source in southeast Alaska. So it's a tricky thing to distinguish. I think we've mostly got it down, but um, it's tricky. Yeah. Yeah, so I think you're asking about all those unknowns. Do they make up any meaningful amount of all the obsidian out there? Uh, no, they don't. So the top five sources probably account for 95% of all the artifacts. We're, we're on this very thin tail now of the very rarest sources that are uh, 
hardly ever seen in the archaeological record. So there's sort of diminishing returns that we're getting to now. Um, there's, I think, 5,000 pieces of Boxitane of obsidian in our, in our catalog. There, uh, in some of these other things, the unknown sources like Group N, which is one of the big unknowns that we haven't pinned down, there's probably 40 pieces of obsidian known from archaeological sites. So that's the scale of the problem now. We're, we're really chipping away at that uh, small uh, remaining set of unknowns. Good question. Yeah. It's, I think it's true, yeah, yeah, so volcanic ash, depending on the kind of uh, volcano, though, uh, obsidian is volcanic glass, and it's high in silica, and a lot of tephras, a lot of volcanic ash, is tiny, tiny shards of glass, high silica glass, so uh, I, I, I'm not used to people ever calling that obsidian, but uh, I think at a small scale, it's true. It's volcanic glass, or very tiny shards of glass. Maybe we could do one more question anymore. There's a couple books left. There's posters. And like I said, if you want a book and maybe didn't even ask a question, I'll take your name and mail you one. So let me know. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. And uh, Amos, uh, I'm going to Shishmaref tomorrow, so this might You're be going to handy. Shishmaref? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We tell Prince Dan for a promo for me. Okay. okay. My name is John. John Hallam. John Hallam. Hallam. Okay. H A L U M. H A L L U M. Okay. Okay. Prince. Okay. So you know Prince. I don't know. I haven't been to Shishmaref before. Oh, it's my first time. Anyway, what happened is that Amos showed me. The, the family treasure, okay? okay? Yeah, yeah. There's and a lot of artifacts. Yeah, yeah. 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 One of the things yeah. he was asking about yeah. is yeah. the glass piece, the trading piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And he says, You sure they're not, uh, you're, are you sure they're not some sort of precious stone? I said, Yeah, that's right. That's, but the thing is, is yeah. Yeah. because they're historical yeah. possession, uh, I said, They're, <laughs> they're valuable. They might be valuable. And yeah. You should keep them yourself because they're okay. your family. But he had a piece yeah. of obsidian the size of my palm. Oh, oh really? Yeah. I gotta get his name. And uh, he oh. said, "I gotta get uh, his name." Unfortunately, he's dead. Uh, but uh, yeah. the, the family's yeah. still around. What's, what's the last name? Uh, uh, Cayetilla. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, they're still around. Okay. And so, the, but the thing was is that he uh, thought that was also possibly a gemstone. Uh -huh. I, know, I, said, I think glass. some people consider it a gemstone. Yeah, it's, it's not a, a precious one, but yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. It was so it's uh, smoky. Can you take the charcoal? I'll come back later, okay? Okay. The charcoal, I'll come back. You got a pencil? Oh, you got a paper? Yeah. Can you grab one here? I'm going to give you his name, and okay. I don't know who's alive and who's dead. Of right. course you'll know. Uh, that'd be great. What great timing. I'm going there Friday, actually. But, uh, <laughs> I've never been there. It doesn't cost us $1,000 to get up there and back. <laughs> it's a haul, um, yeah. Okay. What is it? May I pick oh. these up? Twenty years ago in Owens Valley in California. Oh, okay, okay. And it's just south of Mono Lake there. And and you run off from a uh, uh, a hot spring. Yeah, a little yeah. pond in there down there. Just yeah, yeah. So did you flake this or was no, it found just like no, that? Just like that. Okay. So it's an artifact then? Yeah, I think yeah. and would this be? Yeah, yeah. Okay. These are yeah, that's definitely flake like and I just I just wanted to ask someone that's probably seen a lot of these. I was surprised to see the evenness yeah. of, the, of the, it looks like the splitting rate, uh -huh, uh -huh. but that would seem to be like a microsecond to do this. Oh, yeah. So does that mean yeah, that, they just pop off. does that mean that the wind is, is, has its way, or only because the rock is diving? In other words, if it was, the rock was diving, I'd say it should be not so even. Mm. Well, you know, that's the beauty of obsidian. It's so homogenous yeah. that there's nothing yes. in the rock yes. that interferes yeah. with that wave. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so and could it go so far to say the sound was impaired with the fish? I guess so, yeah. That must have traveled incredibly fast yeah. through there, yeah. Well, you know, you've loaded up a lot of force into that one point yeah. with a rock. Yeah, usually. that's something and I never yeah. thought of. Yeah, it sounds reasonable. Well, thanks. Yeah. Hi. Hey, how are you? How's it going? Good to see you. Well, yeah. How's school? I'm looking forward to fall semester starting. Understood. Oh, okay. Nice to meet you. Yeah, we chatted on the phone once, I think. Yeah. It was fun. It was an adventure. It's so different over there than staying it up and bringing the food the, the long way around the planet. You know, we didn't go through Everest or Samargadon, which is a three-hour flight. We went the other way. are so friendly and so the archaeologists are so interesting. Yeah, it doesn't make any more sense. It's still so linked to the It's far back all so heavy and imperial. Since the Dixon book, what was the title in Trouble? I think it's Arrows and Adelada. Yeah. Arrows and Adelada. If you want one, I'll take your name. Yeah, okay. I was curious. I, yeah. He was commenting yeah. on the porcupine cave. Yeah, yeah. Know, yeah. 40 years ago when I was on that. Oh, okay. Um, the protocol and some of the research after that was uh, basically taking it to that end and some of the yeah. southeast of Asia and some of the yeah. things there were even more exciting. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think that was sort of inspired. The Porcupine River work was inspired by what they were seeing at Bluefish Caves, and yeah, yeah. Jim sort of built on that or pursued that same lead, and it never seemed to pan out in, in the Porcupine. Yeah, I heard the deciduous peak was there, and that was yeah. fascinating. Yeah. The deciduous peak was there. Uh -huh. uh, in the caves, I mean, it didn't get anything, but uh, a lot of interesting comments were made. Yeah. Also, we had good sound around right. the peaks, right. too. Thank you. That Good. was interesting. Glad you liked it. Yeah. Okay, what do you have? Can you read this? Yeah. This is something we were going to get. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Maybe I can track down that piece of obsidian. Okay, yeah, that's my, my little All right. Owl. All right. Well, I'll tell them to tell them to check it out. Yeah. Oh, I see. What I'm doing, I'm going to tell you a story about the first time I went to Spearhead. Uh-huh. I was out in Sitka. Sheldon Jackson was young. We had a setup still. So that the people who were visitors can, you know, focus on it. And, and uh, I got all lined up. And so it just wound up out there. It went way, way wild. So it looks simple. Oh, yeah. It's a good but, it uh, <laughs> but, you know, they were hitting moving parts. I, I see them when I see them today, but it's not moving. But they can hit the paper plate all the time. <coughs> That's pretty, good. That's pretty good trick. Yeah. Right in the middle of so, mm -hmm. it, you know, when a modern person is doing it, it's probably a small piece. Well, I, mean, I have no doubt that people growing up from a young age doing this with their parents and play, and play, and play. <laughs> experts, <laughs> even the average person. Yeah. That's my guess. I think I think some of the key to this thing is looking at the kids. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It's looking at the kids and what they do. I was in Africa a number of years ago, and I was watching the kids play. And they were playing at herding cows, because that was all life progression for them, is what they were going to do when they were bigger. And, and they weren't making weapons, but they were doing all kinds of other things. They were even breeding cows. They'd make out of mud a cow, and then they'd make out of mud a bull. It was obviously a bull, and they'd make the two, and then they'd make a whole bunch more. <laughs> I mean, yeah. You know, and I thought, wow. <laughs> you know.
I have them at my office down here. That's great. But I'm out of town tomorrow, so uh, you can drop in and okay, let's or so or send me an email. Or, yeah. Qu yeah. Question for you on the obsidian. Oh, were you finished? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to okay. say, you know, I taught school on Pensacola Island, uh -huh. and uh, because we were bringing in obsidian artifacts, from the yeah. from somewhere near Cali, oh. but I always tried to track okay. down it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so he's on to that one, huh? Did it seem like artifacts or pebbles? Did it seem like a sword? Okay. Yeah, you know, because I never saw it, but they said they had it. Right. Yeah. Bring it in. There are sources to be found in Alaska, so any of those leads, I always try to find. I'm in touch with Gene. Oh yeah. Yeah, we've worked on some of this stuff together. So you, you're here now in Fairbanks? Yeah, I moved out of the island. Yeah, we're just here now. Yeah, you know, just kind of get down there. You know, I don't know if you can walk by. You know, that house is yeah. on genealogy. Oh, no, I don't get it. Is that where our blue light lives? <laughs> uh, they do kind of our blue light. I don't know. 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 The unknown obsidian, the 41 mystery boys. Um, and you said there was there about 10 percent of the collection. Some of which found a minority. Oh, is there any the guess or speculation as to whether that obsidian just came from a hard to hard to get to places or harsh environments or something like that, or were like way up in the mountains? Yeah, way up in the mountains. Or there wasn't any game there, so it wasn't a good reason to go back. You know, he didn't get any game, but he found a rock, so he brought it back. You know, or some connection that way. And when you start to look at yeah, we thought about all those things that these were. Which is all. I guess the the leading explanation I have is that some of those probably don't exist anymore. They're covered in a landslide. They were such a small deposit they've been eroded and gone. Some that we found, some of the sources that we found. You know, they're just probably one probably uh, there is. hundred yards of one tree, and the I biggest piece is that big. And so the way I can imagine fractured. What's that? Because they're already fractured. Well, they're, well, they're in an ash bed, so they're in a primary deposit. And geologists have explored some of the scientific research to have areas where you might be able to see a lot more of that deposit around. And I, I could imagine in 10 years that whole thing would be pulled to the So I might project that back 10,000 years. When I was a kid, my father went hunting in Northern California and brought back a couple of big obsidian boulders. And we played with them until we cut ourselves right in the middle of the it's sharp. Yeah, very sharp. I mean, it's black. It's the stuff we have. But when you've got a chip thing, you can see through it like glass. So you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, if you ever need a volunteer, I find that can be a camping hard tradition. That's not a problem. Like, oh, anyway, like the kayak, the porcupine, I the full length of it a couple of years ago. So even though I know they're there, they're going to get out. Yeah. Uh, if you ever need someone to go, to go walk around a nice day, one more pair of air. Well, again, the next one. Oh. Got to have ventilators in it. That's all there is to it. I don't know if... Uh, what do you do nowadays? Well, I could used to say I drove a steam engine, a steam locomotive, but I, I worked for the university for 38 years. I launched rockets for almost 20 years out of Poker Flat. I chased lightning and these things called strikes. Of course, the pictures of those, of course, color pictures. Uh, and been to Antarctica. Yeah. Times. I lost count. Yeah. It's embarrassing. Well, we I, I, have, I, I have 40 years worth of spiral yeah. notebooks, yeah. but someplace yeah. in there it's got the trip, uh, but I'm not going to go back and look just for the count, but I lost count. Right. Okay. But, uh, well, well, it sounds like you well, could handle well. anything Alaska could just drop. Uh, well, I have so far. It hasn't there. killed me one. yet. One is ventilate your tent, and another thing is don't go camping in a draw. 4175 is the address. So it's the uh, park service things. building oh, okay. that has a log entryway. Okay. Uh, big, big okay. Right next to the ice center now. Between the coffee shack and the ice center. How could you miss? They don't last. I'm gone until August 7th, so don't get my way. You know, you can get that book other places.
Right. You can find it out here. I know there's a PDF One day online of it. Is that free? Is that this? Is this the beginning? Okay. Well, anyway, they're not built this way. Good. Good. I'm glad you came. Actually, uh, do you know Terry Kaiser? Yeah. Uh, Terry came into my classroom in Flake, showed the kids how to flake. Yeah, that's always a great demonstration. Yeah, it seems like magic. Oh, yeah. 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 It was very small. It was I thought he was retired. I don't know. Yeah. I didn't know him real well, but it's a pretty small community of archaeologists up here. Right. Well, what I did was I put a word together. Oh, thanks. It was very yeah. interesting. Okay. 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 Very enjoyable. Keep it up. And uh, do it again until the more time. And don't forget to turn it on. Yeah, that's my favorite game. Well, you can make it like this. Favorite thing. Oh, no. And the door's locked. But uh, <laughs> do it right now. <laughs> All right. We'll see you. Take, Take care. care. Thanks for coming. Uh, uh, I told you. Had about I don't know eight or ten homes in that. Oh, and just really to go through the ads. I got a real nice lady out there now. She's very nice. And I went into the house and they had all the uh, yeah. I don't think it was a wood bison necessarily. It's some just generic plain bison probably. I don't know. They were just like rabbits. Church there, impressive church, but I don't know what denomination it was. You got to operate it. You can't just go up there. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't just go up there. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave it up there for 10 years. You can't leave just yeah, I knew Debbie folks. pretty well. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We had done a couple projects together. Right. So, we'll be back in the office time in the autumn? Yeah, mostly office time, yeah. Not planning any expeditions? I'm doing a little project in Barrow uh, next yeah, week, but good. it's just a quick little thing. It's mostly a Coast is hit hard. Yeah. Oh yeah, I remember you. Part of the number on? Um, I think I do. Yeah. She and I worked together for years. As a matter of fact, I even worked for her for a short period of time. They were going to get some orientation lined up with Juno. Yeah, that was a. So she's retired now. Oh yeah. Yeah. At the museum. Well, anyway. They were going to get some stimulation to get part of the prerequisite for archaeology. Okay. You guys. 
confirm. Yeah, send me a note. I know the museum's been part of that before. Thank you. By the way, where'd you get that shirt? Okay. Good job. Okay. Next time I'll ask you where she got it. Yeah. You have to confirm.